Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, ah, oh, shit. Wait. I'm gonna cut that out of the video. Alright, so that's it. <clears throat> so just for whoever is watching this and missed the period from the first part to the second part, all we said was that the velocity is zero at the end because the box reaches its maximum position and has to turn around, so it has to get to zero velocity. At those points, the acceleration is maximum because the string is pulling on the box the hardest or pushing on the box the hardest. At the center, the spring is unstretched or uncompressed, so the acceleration is zero, but because the box has been accelerating for a long, the longest time, that's when the velocity is maximum. And all of these functions are going from plus to minus one, so essentially what's in front of the sine and cos will be the, what the maximum value of the function is. So the maximum position is always the amplitude, the maximum velocity will be omega a, and the maximum acceleration is omega squared a because the cos or sine will just um, vary plus to minus, plus one to minus one. So pretty much this whole problem will always depend on your <laughs> surprise. So I was just doing some simple harmonic motion and it turned for there. But we did the whole thing, we did take the whole thing. Oh, yeah. so you can watch it after. Yeah. It's actually recorded now. Um, okay, so let's try doing a, a, a problem or something. Let me erase this now. <clears throat> the problems in this section are usually pretty repetitive. Like, it's, there's not much uh, variety in what could happen. Oh yeah, wait. Let me just do one more thing. Um, we have the box, right, like this. It moves between here and here, like that. You know, with this, I'll just draw the box in. So it moves between here, here, and here. And if I were to draw a graph of the energy. as a function of, wait, what am I trying to do? Never mind, I want to do it like this, actually. Actually, that's good, but it has to be more like this. This is energy, and then here I have x, the x position. So, I like to draw this because it shows you what's happening, what kind of energies do we have here? It's mechanical, but there's two kinds. Energy. Kinetic, yes, and? And potential energy of a spring, right? So here, the box is at zero velocity, so we have the kinetic energy is zero, but the spring is stretched to its maximum, so we have just the spring's potential energy. At the center, the spring is neither compressed nor stretched, so us equals zero, and we have just kinetic energy. So pretty much, the moment I stretch the spring out, I'm adding a certain amount of energy us equal to one half k delta x squared. So the amount by which I pull the spring will set, or the amplitude that I give it will set delta x to a certain value, and that'll give me the initial energy will be just us. From that point on, because these are conservative, uh, it's a conservative force, and there's no friction, and we're assuming that the spring is not heating up as it's being stretched and compressed, energy is conserved, so my total energy will just be equal to the initial energy, which is uh, the spring's potential energy, US. So whatever happened in the system, my total should always be present as an energy in the system. So let's look at this. This is minus one, this is plus one. So initially when the box is stretched to over 
the spring is full over here. I have a certain amount of energy US at plus one, so that's over here. If the box goes all the way to the left, the spring is the compressed, and again I have the maximum energy of the spring, which is just US, because it's, the box is at zero velocity over here. So that would be this point over here. Since that's a, 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 a quadratic, it would look like this. Or that's the energy of the spring as a function of position here. Energy as a function of position. Now, the kinetic energy is one half and v squared, where n is the mass of the box, v is the velocity of the box. We've already found that the velocity of the box is greatest at the center, because that's where the, the um, it's, been, it's just been accelerating from that end all the way to where the center, so it's got the most velocity. That means that when the velocity is maximum, the kinetic energy is maximum, and because the spring in the center is neither compressed nor stretched, there's no potential spring energy. So if this is a graph, this, uh, this line here is us. At the, at the origin here, I have my graph of k, and it would look something like this. Okay, so that's the, the potential energy of the spring and the kinetic energy of the, of the mass. And you see that for every point, this plus this adds up to this. Here we have this, what we have down here is max. This plus that adds up to that. So what I'm saying is that the, the, if you add up the kinetic energy of the spring plus the potential of the box, sorry, plus the kinetic energy of the spring, the two together will always add up to the total energy, which is just whatever I had initially. Right? Always add up to the total here. So the energy stays constant in the system, it just changes forms from mechanic, kinetic to uh, spring potential. <clears throat> Alright, any questions on that? And if this box was moving, instead of horizontally, it was moving vertically like this, the spring would be getting compressed and stretched, so it would have a change in spring energy, the box would be speeding up and slowing down, so it would have a change in kinetic energy, but also the potential energy of the system would be changing, so I'd have UG, the potential gravitational energy, that's also changing. So I'd have three different curves, all varying, but the totals of them would always add up to the total energy, if there was three. And if, if the box was, for some reason, also spinning, as it's doing that, you could have the rotational kinetic energy, but that's, that's not the case here. Okay, so I'm going to erase that, or I can just start moving. So I actually... Um, so a typical problem would be like it'll give you a box. I can actually try to do one. Can I take a look? <laughs> a simple harmonic motion is like further up. By the way, pendulum is another example of something that move in a. Pendulum is also something that we move with super harmonic motion. If you have something like this, you have a pendulum, it will rotate like that. That's very pretty. So it rotate back and forth like this, or swing back and forth. And basically, in this case, as long as you don't give it too, too big of an angle initially, the motion will be simple harmonic. What that means is that the, um, the position of the mass as it goes left and right, if you just look at the shadow of it, right, on the ground, the shadow will just move back and forth like this. And essentially, if you were to plot that on a, like the x-axis position, if you started from over here, that would be in the box, the pendulum over here, as it moves this way to here, to the center, it can move from here down to here, and the motion will look at something like this again, uh, a cosine function. If instead I started from the origin, then the motion would look, if I started at the origin and pushed it this way, it'd be moving to the left. So I would start from the origin and start moving towards the negative side, so it would look like this, etc. Yeah. And basically, it would, the motion could only be modeled as a, 
goes through a sine wave if the initial angle that I swing it from is relatively small. I think like 5 degrees or something is because uh, you have a small angle approximation, which you'll see in your book. If you, if you lift it any higher, it will have the other effects and it won't be as um, simple, as, as simple as this. But basically, in this case, if you remember when you had the spring, the angular velocity or angular frequency was k, square root of k over m. So the entire motion depended only on the spring constant and the mass. For a pendulum, I can't remember, but I think omega was similar, but it was like square root of L over M. Let me just see if so I can remember. The pendulum 448. Oh, G, sorry, yeah. G over L. It doesn't depend on the mass. That's the thing. Independent of the mass of the weight, the, the angular frequency of the motion will depend only on gravity and the length of the pendulum. This. And since omega is 2 pi f, again, now we determine the frequency, and the period is again 1 over the frequency. So the period of the motion is set by the length of the pendulum. Whether you have a small mass or very heavy mass, uh, that's why with the grandfather clock, you know, you can, you, you know the period is set, um, you can measure time accurately, you set it to exactly one second. So the motion of one second of the swaying will uh, move the, the gears, you know, count time accurately because so the heavier the mass is at the bottom, the less will be affected by friction or whatever, or just keep swinging, swaying and keep time in life pretty accurately. So in this case, if you have a pendulum, you use your initial condition, your initial angular frequency is given by g over l. And if you have a, a spring, it's k over m. And from that, you're going to plug it into your equations for uh, x is a cosine omega t plus phi. And then, yeah? You say the spring is k over m, and what's the other one? g over l. That's for a pendulum. So like a string with something attached at the end. Yeah. So gravity over the length. And um, <coughs> so look at this. If you, on page 449, if you swing it by only one degree from here, the, different, the percent difference between using this, because we're using an approximation to make it simple harmonic, is 0%. When you pass at 5, at 5 degrees, the percent difference between what you would get is 0.1%. Um, at 10, it's 0.5. At 15, it's 1.2. At 20 degrees, it's 2.1. And at 30 degrees, it's 4.7. So even at 30 degrees of initial angle, you only have a 5% difference. So it's still pretty accurate for, for a big angle. Okay, so the swinging rod, depth oscillations. I mean, the rest of this section is more intense, but you can figure it out. I think what I should show you um, is. I know the position, I can find the velocity associated 
with the mass at that point. So, because I know K, M, and A, those are constants. Once you start the motion, those are, you can't change those anymore. So pretty much you have a direct relationship between V and X. 